Dude, what do you got on? Jack. You got Jack for Val? Oh, I got a Jack. Dude, I've been fighting this thing for jack. a few minutes. Uh, Alright, I got this Jack landed. These things fight like trucks. They're so awesome. And you get to sight cast to them. Jacks are just absolutely just such cool fish. And uh, look at these things. It's a rush. You gotta do this trip. We got him! <laughs> Woo! Okay, we get some stiff. Yeah! There we go. Just had a massive. Well, sorry about that. Don't like that. This. No, it's, all, it's, it's already it's going. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Making them fight right off the butt of that 12 weight. Just get that fighting butt just right in your abdomen right there and use it. If you don't, you can drag that fight out, make that fight two or three times longer than it has to be. Just get low on that thing in inches a mile. I think we're about 35, 40 minutes into this now. And it's, it's not easy. I'm starting to get a little frustrated, a little tired. You just got to remind yourself to chill out. Tranquilo, man. <laughs> I have a giant rooster fish. Dude, this fight has been so much harder than I ever thought it was gonna be, man. This fish is absolutely kicking my ass right now. And we've got it about 20 feet from the boat and I just can't break it. Dude, that thing is unbelievably strong. Dude. Cut. Be kidding me! Hey, it's Joe at Red's Fly Shop here. I just got back a couple of days ago from an awesome trip to Baja. I've been uh, down there half a dozen times, and it's always a little bit different. And I've never done like an essential gear dump uh, when I've gotten back. And as we're sending more and more groups uh, to fish. The Sea of Cortez, I want to make sure that everybody is well prepared uh, with exactly what you need and nothing you don't. So uh, let's jump into gear a little bit. We'll start with rod and reel selection. So uh, I've got two rods out here. Um, the first thing on rods is buy the absolute best rod that you can afford. Um, it, it does make a difference over the long haul. A good rod starts at 300 bucks. A great rod is going to be over a thousand. Just fall in line where you can. Um, the rod does make a difference in your casting ability, but also reliability. The last thing you wanna have happen is you get down there, you get a couple days into uh, a few day fishing trip and you snap a rod, for instance. Um, better rods are built tougher, especially in saltwater realm. Uh, rod weights should be a minimum of a 10 weight. Um, I carry a 10 and a 12. Uh, this is a 10 weight Sage Maverick here. This is a 12 weight NRX here and uh, the specific rod that you buy isn't as critical as just buying a really good rod. Um, both of these rods will be great. And if you have a brand you're loyal to, hopefully you can find it at Red's and you can start in the Outfit Builder um, in the link in the video description below. Just start with 10 weight or 12 weight, see what we have in stock, take a look, and then you can work through the real selection and stuff too. But rods should be 10 and 12 weight, fast action rods capable of throwing large flies, okay? And fighting uh, hopefully large fish. So uh, rods are all gonna be nine feet long. Uh, you could throw a little bit shorter rod, uh, but you definitely wouldn't want anything over nine feet long. Um, that would be on the long end. Uh, reels should have a high backing capacity. Um, I think our best selling saltwater reel is probably a T-bore. They do take a while to get. Uh, that's a riptide that I fit on my 10 weight uh, right there. And then uh, on my 12 weight, I have one that happens to have a rooster fish on it and uh, that's called their Gulf Stream. So those take a while to get in advance. Um, there are lots of other reels that work well. Um, the Lampson Lightspeed M, um, this is a Sage Spectrum Max. Uh, that's a great reel as well. Um, buy the best reel you can afford in saltwater fishing. The reel should be at least 50 to 75% of the rod price. Um, the reel becomes a little bit more important in especially offshore saltwater fishing than it does on your local trout creek. So. Uh, reels are important um, as far as backing goes. 
Uh, what I have on there is the hatch 68 pound backing um, and I've got several hundred yards. I've probably got 300 yards on there. You can use like the Rio 50 or 65 pound gel spun it is now and it's multicolored, it's great. Whatever backing you have, it should exceed the strength of your tippet is very important. So if you go with 20 or 30 pound backing, you're really at risk for that fish breaking in that weak spot being in the backing. So minimum of 30 pound, but I really recommend you consider the 65 pound backing. Have us set that up for you. Getting that backing wrapped super tight uh, is important. In fact, I was looking at a couple of my reels here and I can actually see in the backing, uh, I don't think the camera would pick it up, where I've had fish run out 150 yards or so and then wrapped it back on really tight. You need that backing wrapped it very tight. That's how you lose fly lines, folks, is if your backing is not wound tight, like on a machine by a professional, the backing, uh, the fish will be running out on heavy drag and uh, that backing will, will cut into itself and bind, tangle, and snap, lose your entire fly line. It's the only way I've lost an entire fly line is having a, well, there's a lot more to the story. There was a shark and some chum involved and it's a whole different story for a different day. But uh, a backing seizure is, uh, is a problem. Uh, as far as lines go, um, the number one line that I recommend is going to be that Rio Outbound Tropical Short in the full intermediate head length. Okay, the more fishing I've done, uh, the more I gravitate towards that line. Uh, that one happens to be an FI. Um, I've played around with a lot of different ones. Uh, but uh, on both of my rods, I like to have the full intermediate head. So. Uh, the FI is the running line itself is floating, and then that entire 30 foot head sinks at an intermediate rate, which is about one and a half inches per second. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, that gets our fly under any or our line under any choppy waves so that we're not stripping that fly right across the choppy waves. Sardines don't do that, or bait fish don't do that. They swim underneath even the lowest dip of the waves, and your line is going to get right underneath those dips, making a smooth retrieve. Uh, also, there's a technique that I'll talk about in a minute when I demonstrate a little bit of casting of just letting your fly sink um, uh, for rooster fish and uh, that intermediate line just seems to sink at the same rate as a dead sardine. So try to wrap your mind around that for just a moment. Uh, the only other line, I haven't used a floating line very much. They haven't be, been very useful because I can actually strip poppers on those intermediate lines just fine. They stay right on top if I move the fly quickly. It is a real leviathan line. Um, I've been on trips in the past. You can see that black sinking portion is a 26 foot fast sinking tip. This line is kind of optional. It's nice to have. I own enough reels. I have three quality reels that I can take on one of these trips. And so I might have two of the intermediate ones ready to go. And if a captain said, hey, we're going to try to, there's, you know, maybe there's a, a school of tuna or something like that that I want to get down a little bit deeper. Uh, I've got this Leviathan or maybe. Uh, I've had Dorado bites before where the Dorado simply bite the fly better when it's a little bit deeper, the more I love with them. So it's nice to have, but the, the fast sink tip is optional. As far as leader goes, so um, I, can, I can just peel this off. Um, this is exactly how it was set up um, for me in Baja. And uh, I've got my intermediate line here coming down, and then I've just looped to loop the straight tippet material into that welded loop. These welded loops, can you see that okay there? Mm -hmm. It's just a loop to loop. I tie my own perfection loop and I think it's really important if you're planning a trip there uh, to get good at doing a perfection loop and become a little bit independent. Um, the captains are happy to help but it's not like going on your typical Montana trout guide float trip where the guide's going to do everything for you. Um, you're going to be, you're going to have a much better experience if you can tie your own knot. So a perfection loop is an essential knot, and then uh, a double figure eight loop knot is gonna be the other one that you wanna learn. But I just loop to loop my tippet onto there. Uh, in, clear, in clear water conditions, which it's almost always crystal clear, I run 25 pounds, scientific anglers, absolute fluorocarbon shock tippet, okay? I like these, I can put them over my wrist and pull line out. If I'm building out a leader system, that ring is pretty nice. I like how that works. Um, I run about, typically seven feet and I've got yeah pretty close to seven feet still on that and uh, I run one piece of tippet with no knots all the way down this works great for me I have a strong cast and I can turn over the fly well with no taper 
Uh, for, for more novice to intermediate level casters, it's not a bad idea to pick up some Rio saltwater leaders that taper down to 20 or 30 pound uh, tippet. And that leader will help turn over just a little bit better. Uh, the other tippet material I will use uh, if we're having um, maybe a bite on tuna uh, or something like that where I need a heavier line, I need to crank the fish in faster, uh, 40 pound is good. Dorado seem to be less tippet shy. If you find yourself a little ways offshore and you're after Dorado, Dorado seem to be less tippet shy than, than rooster fish. Rooster fish, especially on some of the popular breaks, um, a pretty smart fish. So. Uh, but 25 pound is, is my typical, um, and I just run seven feet straight loop to loop connection. As far as flies go, okay, and then uh, I'm not going to demonstrate it here. I have another video, and there's lots of other videos that, that it can be done. But the Steve Hoff double figure eight loop knot is the knot that I like to tie my fly on with. Um, in fact, uh, you can see uh, there's a loop knot left on this. Uh, tan 3 aught sardina, but I like my loop about that big when I tie these flies on. I want it small, and I'm not afraid to leave a little tag on there, just in case my knot folds over, something unexpected happens, but I like my loop about that big. Are you able to get that in focus? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So uh, that's a that's an Enrico Puglisi uh, tan 3 aught sardina. Uh, that's one of my top flies. Uh, the flies are gonna vary a little bit um, from trip to trip and things, but I'm just gonna run through a few of them here so you have a rough idea of what a lot of these flies look like. Uh, let's go ahead and come on down here. And uh, the best way to do this is uh, choose to get a deadly dozen from Reds, and we will choose the flies, maybe even me personally, uh, that you need for your tip, your your trip. And then if you give us any advice in the, in the order comments, we can do it. But there, I'll put a link to the deadly dozens in here too. So. Uh, these are called psychedelic herrings uh, right there. That was a really productive fly for us. That's an easy mac, also a good fly. Um, I think that's a perfect minnow. Um, it's important to have a few smaller flies like this uh, in the event you start messing around with some of the, the inshore species like sea, smaller sea bass uh, and things like that. It's nice to have that in case there is no bite on some of the other things. Uh, major uh, sardine right there. Um, this was probably our most productive fly on the trip. That was called a gym sock. And uh, the gym sock comes in a couple different sizes. I think the other one blew off the table. That's a six aught there. Six aught's better for fishing from the beach. Uh, and then the four aught, um, I believe it is, is better for beach or fishing out of the boat. A couple of poppers are okay. I'm not super picky about those, but sometimes you get into a bite where the fish are, it's cloudy, you can't see the fish well, they're a little bit deeper. You may end up blind casting on the shoreline a little bit for some sea bass and other things to kill time, depending on where you're at in the Sea of Cortez. Uh, there's a major mullet. Uh, you don't need a lot of dark colored flies. Most of them should be that nice white bait fish color, especially the tan uh, sardina there. Uh, but keep a couple of dark colored flies uh, as well there. So there's lots of other little tackle items. I'm not gonna get too bogged down. Uh, just know that you can get all this tackle from Reds. I'll put some links in the video description. Uh, I'm going to grab my rod now and I'm going to show you just a couple of quick casting tips and little tips to help you have the most possible success on your trip to Baja. All right, so you're going to wind up most of the time fishing in some kind of panga boat, uh, whether it's rooster fish or dorado, most of the fishing is gone from boats. Uh, there's going to be live chum involved, or at least there should be as long as bait is available. The captain's going to have a live well, hopefully just chocked full of sardines or other bait fish. So the first thing you want to do when you get in the boat, um, you're going to go on patrol and you're either going to be looking for fish or going to a popular spot. Maybe you're looking for birds in the distance, hitting a ball of, of small bait fish and then predatory fish uh, surrounding the area. As, you, as the boat pulls up, the captains are going to be very aggressive on, on throwing uh, sardines into the water and attempting to keep those predatory fish near the boat. Just remember, the ocean is big. Those fish would rather not be by your boat so we need to give them a reason to stay within range. So uh, one thing we're going to do is when we when we get up to the spot, um, be prepared. Uh, I really recommend that you do some stretching and you practice your balance and just be good at moving about the boat because there will be some listing to the boat. It won't be big swells or anything like that, but I want you to just be prepared. Uh, anymore, I like to wear sneakers in the boat. 
um, most of the time. I think I move around the boat really well. I know some people like to fish barefoot anymore. I typically wear like a not like an athletic style boat shoe or a sneaker. Um, I think that's the most comfortable for me to move around the boat. Um, the first thing I do when I when I get out um, is uh, I take out my line to the point where I can comfortably get the distance out with about two false cows. Um, I'm so familiar with my equipment uh, that I don't mark my line, but I think it's a really good idea for people to mark their line at like, you know, max reasonable distance, a big black mark right there. I see way too much. My boat partners don't have a good idea of how much line to pull out. They pull out way too much line and then they've got slack line all over the place. They're stepping on it, turns into a giant mess or they don't have enough line to make an adequate cast when the fish shows up 15 feet beyond line they have. So, maximum reasonable distance, okay? Then what I do is I strip my line back in, and let's pretend I'm up here on the casting deck, and I try to lay it out so it's not all piled on itself. And let's just assume I'm kind of waiting for a shot. And uh, captain's throwing some sardines, we see the fish. You need to develop an aggressive casting style that allows you to get all of this line out with two casts, okay? So for me, I'll usually lay my fly on the water first so that I have a little bit of tension. That way when I lift up initially, that fly is stuck to the water because it's a great big moppy style fly. And then as I lift up, it will draw some of my line out, giving me a little bit more leverage. Then I can shoot a little into my back cast once forward. And I'll send all that line very, very quickly. These real outbound shorts are designed to be cast like that. If you're taking more than about two false casts, your, your, your technique, you're not letting the line go and you're not using your technique right. I really encourage you practice as free people. So get, get familiar with how to do that before you go on the trip. Uh, I'm going to run through that again. I lay my line out in a way uh, that hopefully it won't wrap around anything else. Lay it out on the deck of the boat. Maybe that needs to be a little bit closer like so. Um, I'll keep my line up here in my hand, my fly dangling here. Uh, the fish start hitting the bait and there's just like hand grenades going off in the water. It's very intense and exciting. I'm going to slap my fly on the water. I'm going to pick it up, throw it once, and my second shot will go. Okay. You can have up to two false casts going forward. You throw three or four, there's only one reason to throw three or four. Okay, so we're gonna start talking a little bit about strategy on these fish here. The timing of your cast is really critical, um, especially with rooster fish. The way they eat, they come in and they stun the prey and it's really intense. It's so exciting, it'll make your heart stop the first couple of times you see it. But those rooster fish will come in and they'll just terrorize uh, a couple of sardines. They can't always grab them that first time through, but they stun them and they immediately do a 180 and they come back to that white water froth they create. And so when I was down there, uh, you know, our, our outfitter, our outfitter and host on this last trip said, yeah, when they're moving that fast and doing that, just aim right for the froth. So I might have to false cast as they're racing around and then boom, they hit, they hit the surface and then I try to drop it right in that ball of white water right there. Immediately when it hits, you need to be into your strip like so. Okay, so that's kind of like lesson two here, I suppose. So we, we make our cast, we lay it out, and I'm immediately into the strip. Never let go of the line with your offhand. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the mistake that a lot of people make, they see it all day long, all the time, I used to do it all the time, is they shoot the line, they, here we go. Oh, cameraman, <laughs> cameraman's injured. Man, I'm gonna pay for that, it's gonna cost me at least one beer. Uh, two beers. Oh, that's a pretty good welt right there. I didn't draw any blood, did it? Um, this is real live action, folks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let go of that line. Watch out, camera guy. And uh, what happens much of the time, I'm going to have to artificially replicate this, and I know you at home have done this. That line constantly gets around the butt of the rod, okay? And every now and then, you won't notice it, and you'll hook a fish, and then fish goes to run, and Boom, you know, the fish breaks off or pulls the rod out of your hands. I've heard a couple of guys describe that. We can't allow, allow that to happen for a huge variety of reasons. We need to be diligent about sending this cast out and being right here in the strip before it even hits, okay, as it's decelerating. But I never let go of it here. Even if I'm gonna shoot a cast for maximum distance, like so, I send it and I let the line slide through my hand, I maintain my grip, okay? That way I can put that line right back in my hand, 
just like that right there and I'm already into the strip. So every time that fly hits, here I go. Here's my shot. Oh, there's a little white water. Boom, I'm there and I'm in the strip just like this so I can pull all the slack out of my line. I can make that fly move gently forward just like that. The body on the fly will straighten up. My tippet will straighten up. And generally speaking, you need to be moving that fly the second it hits. You can use a variety of different stripping techniques. Um, you know, ask your captain, even if your captain doesn't speak great English, just ask him to show you. You know, he, he can show you by hand and you can pick up that cadence, okay? So I want my feet forward on the deck anytime I think a fish is gonna, could possibly strike. And I'm gonna stay cool, stay calm, and don't trout set. You understand? Do not lift the tip of that rod. It doesn't work, it doesn't hook him, you're gonna fail. You've gotta keep the tip down and stay cool. I recommend you're stripping that line. You're probably gonna see the strike. It's gonna be violent. It's gonna blow your mind if you're a trout fisherman going saltwater fishing. Hook them here, find the fish with your left hand, and then just bring the butt of the rod right into your waist like this, then step back. And when you have developed that initial all out tug of war like this, then we can start to bring the rod up just a little bit to soften the acceleration of that fish like so. And when the fish is running and I have this slack line here, keep your line hand away from the rod to prevent over hop of the line around the butt of the rod. So watch that last piece twice if you need to, but we need to be right in the strip to straighten things up. And I'm gonna single hand strip like this, getting my left hand or my line hand back to the front as quickly as possible, <clears throat> just like that right there. And uh, I wanna make sure I'm careful too that if I have a fish following the fly and I think I'm gonna get so close to the boat the fish won't eat. It's a bit of a leap of faith but sometimes you can take the fly away from the fish and throw it right back in and the fish simply thinks the, the sardine or the bait fish jumped out of the water. If it doesn't look like that fish's pursuit is gonna get there in time before it gets scared from the boat you may have to do that. There's a, there's a thousand little tricks that's just one of many. Um, the next stripping technique I'm gonna show you is you're gonna get into some situations uh, where needlefish are constantly grabbing your fly, and you don't want to hook needlefish. They're, they're this long, and they're about this big around. And if you just stop stripping for needlefish, they will generally back off. You don't want to waste your captain's time or your time unhooking those smelly things with giant vampire teeth. So we want to stay away from needlefish. Needlefish is biting, just stop, okay? So that's one thing that's going to happen for you quite a bit. The other thing is, a lot of times we may have cloud cover. Uh, these fish may be coming out at just anywhere we may have jack creval uh, as well and we just we want to hook those jacks a lot of the time so if we're going to cast a long ways and we just send that line out okay like so i'm going to go ahead and put my rod down here like this and i'll go ahead and two-handed strip just like that right there and that makes a really nice action of that sardine swimming right near the surface it's a little bit awkward when you when you hook them. It's not too bad, it seems a little awkward, but you'll hook them with your hands right here. If you have a problem trout setting, try the two-handed strip because you can't lift your rod tip as the fish bites, okay? So that's a, like a no-brainer. But I can strip, 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 strip. When I hook them, I just go like that right there, and now I've got the fish, and the fish is peeling out line. So the two-handed strip works really well. It gets a lot of bites. Um, there, the only real downside to the two-handed strip is that you can't pick up and recast really quickly. So if I've got a fish that's going, and they're blowing up here and they're blowing up here, and holy cow, you know, we got one at you know, 11 o'clock over here. If I'm one-handed stripping, I can pick up and I can chase some of these fish around really quickly like so. Um, but uh, if I'm two-handed stripping, you know, that's for my long cast where I'm committed. I'm just not quite as agile on moving the fly kind of about the bay. Um, when it comes to fighting these fish, you could drag some of these fights on these big roosters out for four hours if, if, if you wanted to or you, you, you didn't get right after it. But, um, a, you know, some really good technique for fighting these fish is one, you hook a rooster fish over 50 pounds, it's gonna kick your ass, okay? You're gonna be exhausted, trust me, you. But what we need to do is we need to get the butt of the rod right into our hip, we need this rod low, and ca cameraman, I'm gonna have you step on the line. Bogey, shipping manager, winner of two free beers, I'm getting whacked in the neck by me. Um, so yeah, we'll do about right there like that. So, can you see the rod okay, Bogey? Mm, yep. Okay, so, 
when we, I'm gonna crank my drag down. I don't know how many pounds are on there, um, but before you start casting, have your captain check the drag if you're, if you're inexperienced, okay? So I'm gonna get my drag cranked down and uh, I'm gonna fight a fish from this position right here, okay? I'm using my back muscles, not my arm. Fighting butt, I'm doing what needs to be done with it and it's in here. After you land a big rooster fish, you're gonna be sore all about your abdomen from that fighting butt, jab it into your sight. I see people try to fight big fish like this. That doesn't work. That's just pathetic. Seriously, people, stop doing that. You drive me insane. Get the butt of the rod in your, in your pelvic bone right there, lower abdomen, and drive that in there. And he can feel it on his foot. He's standing in line. I am pulling hard right now. If I have bend in my rod like this, I could bend this rod into infinity and the, the tension's not gonna increase. Those rods are designed for the tension not increase as I pull them into a circle. I get like this, now I'm letting the reel work for me, I'm pulling off the edge, and a good reel, a high quality saltwater reel will do just what this T-board does, and that's creep out. You can see when I'm pulling back on that, my rod tip is not busting up. And as I'm pulling out, and I wish, I wish you were here in person to understand how this works. I can no longer pull drag off that reel at that angle. Same drag setting as I reel down like this, no problem. I can pull so much harder with that low rod angle. So use low rod angles, get that butt in there, use your reel, don't finger the reel handle. That's a bad habit. If you need to add some additional brakes, you can run that line right over your fingers and just give a little additional friction right there if you're trying to slow down maybe a longer run and you just want to ease up the brakes you can finger the line like that when the fish gets around the boat and we're, we're working on landing this fish like so and i've got that low rod angle lots of tension i can run the line right over my fingers and if that fish blows up and gives me a big run surprises me i can drop it out of my hand and let that reel creep out just like so but Get low on those things, use your body, use your legs. Don't reach up the rod, I've made that mistake before. You'll shatter a rod in no time. You could put two hands on the rod, just like so, hang on to it, use that fighting butt, and hopefully wind up with a giant rooster fish uh, and uh, wind up with a fishier dream. So hopefully these tips help. Check out the links in the video description. Uh, we host and coordinate trips to Baja, even if you just want a referral contact reds and we'll we'll point you in the right direction to plan a great trip.